Elaine Willett. I am the Principal Historic Environment Advisor at Natural England and I help to shape my organisation's approach to heritage and to nature recovery, particularly um, as, it, as it relates to our nature recovery agenda. Um, so I'm here today to introduce our newest guidance on nature recovery in the historic environment, which builds on the themes that we've discussed, we discussed with CIFA over previous years. So forgive me for doing two slides, uh, two separate lots of slides at once. Right, so a bit of background, climate and biodiversity crises. Um, probably don't need to tell anyone in the room much about it, but I thought I would start off with some stats. The state of our natural environment in light of the twin uh, crises around climate and biodiversity is really well documented and the abundance of species across the UK has declined by 19% since 1970. Sorry, some of the slide wordings are a bit off on there, um, which is alarming in and of itself, but even more worrying when you consider how depleted our natural resources were even by 1970. An awful lot of harm had been done by then. Human activities have led to habitat loss, unsustainable farming practices and development all mean that the UK now has less than half of its biodiversity remaining and is in free fall in places. The evidence from the last 50 years presented in State of Nature reports um, show that the intensive way in which we manage our land for farming and the continuing impacts of climate change are two of the biggest drivers of nature loss. At sea, unsustainable fishing and climate change are the major contributing factors to, um, to the loss of our natural environment as well. So what has government been doing about this? We've seen government's response to these crises include setting out a series of strategic goals in its initial 25 year environment plan, which really crucially from our perspective included heritage right from the outset. And they were then translated into legally binding targets um, in the Environment Act of 2021. Um, 2021 was an exciting time for us. Nature Recovery Network was launched and the Office for Environmental Protection, which holds government and other public bodies to account for meeting the targets set out in the Environment Act, was set up. Um, and then the 25-year environment plan was renewed and refreshed on a five-yearly basis. So in 2023, we saw the um, second version of that plan, the Environmental Improvement Plan, being published. These plans commit us to being the first generation to leave the environment in a better state than we found it. And the long-term conservation and enhancement of our historic environment is an essential component and commitment expressed within those plans as part of the beauty, heritage and engagement objective. So... As part of all of this landscape of policy and strategy that's been going on over the past few years across government, something called the Nature Recovery Network was established. Um, it's been established to help deliver many of the targets set out in the Environment Act. Natural England is working with a broad suite of partners um, to help address the three challenges of biodiversity loss, climate change, and also public health and well-being, which shouldn't be ignored. Um, the NRN, Nature Recovery Network, includes a series of actions around the creation of nature-rich places, improving our environment's resilience to climate change and providing better green spaces for people to enjoy. And one of the NRN's specific um, actions relates to the historic environment and our cultural landscapes, bold here for these, for our purposes, um, and the way in which it contributes to the natural environment. They are, after all, one in the same. They are indivisible. Um, it's this action and the ways in which our rich heritage can contribute to the objectives, all of these objectives listed for the Nature Recovery Network, that led us to create specific guidance to help advisors and land managers um, turn these aspirations into reality. So what does Nature Recovery actually involve? Um, the Nature Recovery Network is a partnership of over 400 organisations. Um, open to all, any organisation that wishes to join can do. And it aims to take us from a place of protecting what we've got in terms of the natural environment to uh, an active restoration of the natural world by creating more wildlife rich places that are bigger, better and more joined up, more resilient. The thing from our perspective, working within Natural England and a lot of the projects that we work on is that the polluter pays principle doesn't apply. It rarely applies at any rate. And the checks and balances and standards and methodological approaches to uh, that apply to developer funded archaeology are often absent or really poor fit for the stuff that we're dealing with, which is where our recent work to develop support mechanisms, the guidance document is just one of them, have come in. I've listed some of the tools of nature recovery. There's a lot of acronyms and jargon speak in the world of nature recovery. So forgive me, and this is not an exhaustive list, but it's just a sense of some of the stuff that you might hear in conversations about biodiversity net gain or conservation covenants or local nature recovery strategies. They're all part and parcel of this bigger nature recovery network picture. 
So, um, how does heritage even contribute to nature recovery in the first place? Um, none of us needs to be told in this room that archaeological sites are monuments um, very frequently preserve high quality habitats that have been reliant on traditional management techniques. Um, high quality habitat mosaics are preserved in many historic landscapes, historic parkland being just one type um, of landscape. The um, network of heritage assets like canals and railways and traditional routeways provide connectivity and corridors between important habitats. Heritage sites help to um, sequester carbon in a stable, long-lived habitat types and also the narratives that we um, that we explore via our historic environment expertise can really help to shape debates and inform and engage and educate people on the ground and really get them involved in the value of what they've got and why they need to act in order to preserve it. But what we need is the right guidance and support and the processes embedded into all of these different nature recovery tools um, in order to get the job done properly. So that's where our new guidance came in. So last summer, we published this guidance. It's available on the Algeo and Historic England websites. Don't ask why it's not available on our website. Um, and uh, it's primarily designed for our Natural England advisors. Natural England has got around 3,000 staff now, and the vast majority of them do not come from a historic environment background. So this stuff is fairly daunting, fairly difficult to wrap your head around. Another thing that you have to deal with in an already overwhelmingly complex array of things you need to think about on the ground. However, it's applicable across the board, and actually it's a little bit of a kind of basic guide to anyone who is coming at it from any perspective in terms of integrating historic and natural environment um, out there on the ground. We will run through the chapters very quickly. One thing I did want to mention is we did some, before we produced this guidance, we did some, um, some evidence gathering amongst our own colleagues, um, bearing in mind we're talking to a largely ecological audience. 88% of the respondees to our questionnaire said that the historic environment was either important or very important to them personally, which is really interesting. 94% recognised it was part of Natural England's remit. 27% um, were reasonably confident in dealing with it or less. 75% had no historic environment training. So there's this huge gap in terms of support. So the guidance, which you can download at your leisure after this um, after event, runs through very, very quickly. Some of the real basics, but it's important to establish those basics in the minds of our advisors. Um, what is the historic environment? Why is it important? What's in it for me? How can it help me get my job as an ecologist or a farm advisor done better, basically? Um, we underpin it with some very basic core principles, effectively. Consider the historic environment from the outset, understand the value of what you've got before you start making decisions about what you do next with it. Um, obviously, abide by your legal protections, but also policy and guidance and best practice documents, and there are a lot out there. Um, and avoid damage to the historic environment wherever possible. That should always be our default, uh, default position. As Caitlin alluded to earlier, it's the natural environment improvement. What's the harm, right? Um, stepping back and rolling back from the attitude um, to um, to something a little bit more um, nuanced from our perspective um, has been a really important part of, of this guidance. We talk a lot about integration within Natural England and we um, have laid out a specific case study. It will be um, one of many to come around what, what do we actually mean by integration. It's a really Great words to throw around, but what it means is about getting more bang for your buck, making one environmental intervention, but ensuring that that intervention is done in a way that ensures you get two, three, four, five, six different environmental objectives out of that single intervention. And sometimes that can take a bit more planning and a few more conversations. It's nearly always about the way in which stuff is done and not what you're doing in the first place. And there's a particular case study that just kind of highlights some of the um, the realities of how an advisor might go about achieving that in real life. <laughs> The other thing as well is to consider is that there's plenty of projects out there that didn't think about the historic environment from the outset. They might be 20 or 30 years old. They might be in the, the later phases of a really ongoing and long-lived project. And that isn't to say that there is a real benefit in coming to the party late. I'd rather you came to the party late than not at all. So opening up those conversations to perhaps a slightly shame-faced colleague who doesn't want to admit that 10 years ago they forgot about any of this and to have, you know, a really supportive conversation about, all right, well, what is it that we can do best moving forward um, is a really important part of what we're here to do. 
Case studies, we um, ha are developing a library of case studies. Um, they are aiming to be brief, engaging, illustrative, topic-based, inspirational, hopefully. Um, an example of which is here. They are all available for um, download along with our guidance document. The case studies um, that we've done at the moment, as I say, 13 as of yesterday, but um, you know, more to come. Um, are divided on the, the six major themes of our nature recovery work that we do. So taking case studies where historic environment assets or features or approaches have ultimately delivered more for biodiversity, other natural environment um, processes, than they would have done had they not been there. So what's in it for me as a, as a Natural England advisor? I want to have an archaeological site on my nature recovery project because I'm going to get more out of it if only I can understand how to get the best out of it and that's what these case studies kind of demonstrate in practice what's next from natural England's perspective we are continuing to embed our historic environment work into all of those delivery mechanisms that we saw so making sure that the processes and practices and standards are embedded in things like biodiversity net gain or local nature recovery strategies all the like that is an enormous job it has has to be said um, we are in the process of publishing additional guidance. So this is a kind of the Nature Recovery and Historic Environment Guidance is an umbrella document that covers uh, a very big, an enormous suite of, um, of environmental topics under a single um, guidance document. And we'll be going into more detail, drilling down into more detail with successive annexes and additional documents. As I say, growing our library of case studies, continuing to build momentum across the heritage sector, to talk conferences, but also developing collaborative partnerships and really exploring the ways in which we can um, we can deliver more together. And um, I'm, it would be remiss of me not to mention the joint statement that we've recently signed with Historic England and the National Lottery Heritage Fund around collaborating at that strategic level to ensure that the support and funding is there to deliver what we're talking about in this guidance. So. That's it.